Hello and welcome to Money Reimagined. I'm Michael Casey. Money is a communication device. It's how we signal what we value and what we don't. We use it to communicate that a debt has been established or that it has been cleared. It's an expression of power, a means of measuring each other's worth in society. Some of this can be quite harmful as all that messaging can skew the decisions we make. It elevates actions that are made in the name of money over ones that might be better made in the name of, say, our health, our relationships, or the well being of the planet. Yet a world without money is near impossible to imagine. So instead, there's a growing debate over how we change money itself. And while that movement is founded on the emergence of a new superior cryptocurrency technology that decentralizes both the issuance and record keeping element of this all important communication tool, it too is caught up in the question of what is being said. What is the story behind this new form of money? It's a question we obsess about quite a bit on Money Reimagined. In fact, the question is ingrained in the title of this podcast. How can we reimagine or rather how can we retell the story of money via these new technologies? Sometimes raising these issues about the semiotics of Bitcoin and its imitators can seem to both their advocates and critics as if we are reducing them to something meaningless. But in reality, money is nothing without story. This is not to say these new technologies don't offer a tangible, practical improvement on the prior technology. By all sorts of measures, Bitcoin is simply better than both gold and fiat currency. But without a narrative, without a sense of meaning behind it, it's worthless. This, of course, has been the case for all successful forms of money. If there is no shared belief in its value, a currency has no capacity to play that important communicating role. Gold's meaning has been caught up for centuries in stories of opulence, conquest, and survival. The dollar story throughout the 20th century was caught up in romantic ideas of the American dream. Crypto needs storytellers. It's why Dogecoin, quite literally a joke coin, has been successful. It's semiotics play to the meme culture of the internet, energizing a community that wants to believe in something fun, perhaps as a distraction of the more staid story of money that bankers have told for decades. And it's why Bitcoin has long attracted a rich industry of memes, jokes, and colorful imagery, all in search of a narrative that people can believe in something of meaning that drives acceptance, adoption, and belief. In many respects, that's what this moment of monetary transition is all about. A battle for meaning, a fight between different stories seeking to capture people's imagination. To dive into this rich topic this week, we are joined by two people who are among the leading storytellers of this moment. We have Nathaniel Whitmore, better known as NLW, whose hugely successful daily breakdown podcast on Coindesk often delves into the shifting narratives around crypto. And we've also got Niraj Agrawal, Chief Communications Officer at Coin Center, whose entertaining Twitter feed has earned him a reputation as Bitcoin's Chief Meme Officer. Before we meet them, let's welcome my co-host, Sheila Warren. Hi, Sheila. Hey, Michael. So, I mean, this sort of like feels like we're going full circle here, right? Our, our very first podcast, uh, we started with this idea as, of money as a narrative um, and, you know, a discussion around what we meant by reimagining money. And we had a, an artist, uh, Nikki Enright, and we had um, uh, uh, Lana Schwartz. Schwartz, who is uh, an anthropologist, talking to us about these ideas, these cultural semiotics concepts and how it ma matters in terms of money but right now for some reason i think this whole stuff has been even more elevated right the, the dogecoin conversation but you know game stops there was this great cover of uh of new york magazine the other day and an excellent story in fact delving into whether or not you know money is actually kind of having all of its meaning challenged at this moment with these concepts like stonks and nfts and so forth <laughs> um, what do you make of it all yeah well i i would be we'd be remiss not to kind of harken back to that first episode i will note for the record that my globos are now framed and on a wall in my house which reflects their meme value to me uh, and i think the idea you know is that there was a lot of criticism in the early days about well wh what is this based on it's valueless there's nothing here and i think the argument we were trying to make at the very beginning of the show was well 
that's been true throughout the course of history, whether it was the giant, you know, giant stones or whether it was the metal that was forged or whether it was whatever it was, there's always been this cultural currency that underlies the value of anything we deem money. Uh, and that is that is the same as true here of Bitcoin specifically, but of cryptocurrency in general. And so I do think that what's been interesting is to watch how social media has really helped catapult the, the meme, the memeness, if you will, of this whole, uh, this whole community and ecosystem and play with that. It's a very playful way, but it also has had a lot of power. So I'm really interested to talk to our guests today to hear a little more about how memes have helped drive some of the narrative here and how it's a new way of gaining the kind of cultural currency and community that was necessary with any form of money throughout history in order for it to gain traction. Let's do that right now. But before we do, I think it's worth actually just taking that word meme and uh, delving into it a little bit before I throw to NLW a question I want to get to him. And that is because like memes have, have uh, come to mean something in the internet age. They, they, we talk about, like we think about the cat videos and you know, all the, and so that's what we think of as a meme as something of the internet. But of course, this is a concept that goes right back. In fact, <laughs> of course, Richard Dawkins came up with this and his idea, and he could identify the concept of a meme in his, his book, The Selfish Gene, um, and recognize it as like this fundamental building block of culture. That these are the, it's kind of these evolving ideas, this idea that an idea is a core concept and on that we build things. So memes, in fact, describe pretty much every aspect of how we communicate and tell stories to each other. So I just want to put that out there because we're going to be using the word meme quite a bit today, I would think. Uh, yeah, there's one thing else I think to add to that yeah. is that the concept of a meme is not something that's static. It is meant to have a dynamic component to it or dynamic nature, which can kind of evolve over time. And so one of the things I find fascinating and powerful about memes in the cryptocurrency space is the idea that there can be this evolution of a meme or a series of memes is something that, again, is kind of driving the entirety of the ecosystem in some very fundamental way. Exactly. I mean, that, that is the, the evolutionary aspect of this. In fact, that's a good segue because I will go now to NLW. Um, and, you know, you featured uh, recently a guy who you, you've, you've used quite a bit on the show, Ben Hunt, um, his, uh, of, of Epsilon Theory. And he's just such a good writer. And you, 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 I think you did a long read of one of his most recent pieces the other day. And I'm going to quote from that where he was actually you know, talking about this shift in, in the narrative around Bitcoin and whether it was a good thing. And he says, there is only story. There is only narrative. There is only common knowledge. What everyone knows that everyone knows about the value of art, common knowledge that emerges from our social interaction with story and narrative. In every respect, that matters. Bitcoin is epsilon theory. What was he talking about? Well, I, I mean, so I think that the key thing about memes are that they create their own gravity. They are self-replicating. They are self-propagating, right? Memes are, the memester pushes it off the hill and then it either rolls down or it doesn't, but they have almost no control. That's why when corporate departments hire people to create memes, like sometimes they get lucky and do it, but ultimately it's, it's sort of a, a force that is different than other types of marketing. And I think that the the notion here, part of what makes memes so integral to Bitcoin and the crypto enterprise in general is the fact of is the, the, the aspect of them that is a reorganization or reimagination of how things happen in societies and cultures that isn't through traditional institutions. Um, memes are the natural kind of uh, atomic unit of marketing in a world in which there aren't marketing departments, right? And because it's a, it's a pure kind of market uh, exploration, interpretation of ideas, and the, the ones that people are attracted to are the ones that surface. And I think what Ben is talking about ultimately is that a lot of the battle uh, that sort of lies underneath Bitcoin is which ideas about what Bitcoin is went out ultimately. And I think what he's identifying in this piece is that as institutions uh, kind of unarguably become a driver of the financial aspect of Bitcoin, there is already and is likely to be more of a competition f around which ideas of Bitcoin uh, are, are kind of ascendant in the long term. So I think I think that that's what he's doing. I think, you know, my instinct is that Ben also is kind of dramatizing a battle to come that has started in order to get more attention for it. Right. Um, so, I, I, but I, I think that that's kind of the, the core of it. 
So I love what you said, Nathaniel, this idea that meme distribution uh, or what, what really gets viral is, is kind of determined in decentralized fashion. No matter how hard you might try or how much money you might pour into the creation of a meme, you really can't control what happens with it. It has to have more democratic interest across a wide variety of stakeholders in order for it to actually get the pickup that will get it traction. And so in some ways that does reflect, I think, the entire theory of change underlying crypto, which is that you can you can actually create uh, more honest and transparent and um, I would argue interesting uh, structures and surface kind of what's happening in a community if you're kind of taking this bottoms up type of approach. But Neeraj, at the risk of dramatically overthinking all of this, you know, you have been uh, widely but called by many the meme leader of Bitcoin. So really eager to get your thoughts. You know, why? What do you think that memes have become so important, or do you agree they have become very important in the crypto space? Uh, well, first of all, I'm definitely not the, the meme leader of Bitcoin. There, if anything, my flame is dying a little bit. It's gone on to the next generation. Um, I think that what Nathaniel was saying is kind of spot on, that the meme, memes are a particularly important uh, unit, I guess, of organization, of getting people organized in the crypto world, because there is no top-down mandate that you would see in a marketing department. So because the future of these politic, these uh, crypto networks, uh, say some up proposed upgrade to the Bitcoin network or downgrade as some might see it, uh, are very political in nature, it's essentially uh, people are sorting themselves into blocks based on these memes. So like uh, obvious example is the meme of like Bitcoin is for payments versus store value or whatever that we saw in the uh, the hard fork, right? So, so in that way, memes are very important. They just they they help people form the sort themselves into political parties based on what they think they're trying to do. You're on mute, Michael. Yeah, yeah. So that that to me is like just this core way of thinking about this right now, right? There's there's like the battle for uh, where Bitcoin goes is, is a battle over memes. It's a battle of what does it actually mean. Uh, does it stand for this, you know, institutional store of value uh, opportunity, this speculative vehicle, or is it something to do with, you know, unlocking freedoms? Is it all about uh, removing the middleman and creating access for those who are outside of it? Um, you know, maybe, you know, NLW, since, you know, you, you basically have, I think, shaped your entire show around these, these narratives who's winning I, is, is and can you sort of get into some of the tension that's there around this well i think there's a lot of times that competing or potentially competing memes can coexist the question is what exogenous forces uh, kind of force the issue, right? Force uh, a, a decision of one versus the other. In the case of the block size war, you know, the, there was a there was an external exogenous force that was trying to change the protocol on the basis of a different interpretation of what it was supposed to be. And so that you know, it was no longer the case that you could have two different kind of competing ideas for what Bitcoin was supposed to do because the issue was being forced. I think that the the you know the one that people are seeing in the future is around, I mean, to put it super, super simply, like, can you have sound, sound money without censorship resistance, right? Can you take all of the things that people like about the sort of anti-inflation hedge type properties of Bitcoin and the cap supply? And, you know, on top of that, the great, like, you know, kind of settlement finality and speed that comes with it when people dig in, it's sort of, you know, becomes very quickly this unbelievable treasury asset, uh, you know, with, uh, with a, a version of it that sanguinized, you know, and and for the full KYC AML regime, or do those things are they intrinsically related in a way that feels pretty clearly like it's going to be the next battleground? So, Niraj, you know, as a as a comms officer at Coin Center, and Coin Center being you know essentially uh, a, a lobbying group, it's there to sort of. Uh, try to drive the narrative to con to convince people, particularly lawmakers, but also the general public at large on how to view and how to uh, treat in terms of policy and everything else, uh, cryptocurrencies and this technology generally. Um, can you frame that? I mean, how do you, how do you, to you go about the process of telling the story with, with an end like that, a goal such as I just described? So, uh 
like you said, just for background, Coin Center is a, an advocacy group. Uh, we lobby on behalf of the technology and over the, we've been doing it for six years now. And over the years, it's always manifested in kind of the same way. A regulator or policymaker looks at this, this Bitcoin thing, this Ethereum thing, whatever it is, and thinks um, this is new, this is scary, this treads into some areas that are traditionally regulated in some way. Um, and, you know, should we just, should we just make it illegal? Like, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out what they should do about this. Uh, so then it, we kind of rose to the challenge and appointed ourselves or deputized ourselves to go in and uh, explain ourselves, make our case, right? This is valuable. Um, there are elements of this, uh, kind of what, what are the elements of how this network works? How does that fit with your uh, compliance frameworks? How can you meet your enforcement goals uh, within this sort of new world? And historically, uh, most regulators have said like, okay, we get it. And they, they back off the idea of, of just knocking out the whole cryptocurrency concept. And they're like, okay, we can actually work in this world and target specific actors that are breaking the law, right? So that's, that's where we ended up. And so that is a huge part of sort of, if we're bringing back to memes, I guess, is this idea that um, there is something real here. Uh, we are doing something um, is like that, that's a, that's, that's a, an ongoing problem, I guess, is just making that clear to the world, right? That this is more than the magic beans kind of beanie baby things that, that it's very easily dismissed as that there is something real happening here, even though uh, there's quite a lot of sort of gross behavior as well. And, and that's been our job is just to show that there is something, however small there that is worth protecting. You know, so one of the things I enjoy the most about this space that I find alternately entertaining and energizing is, you know, the idea that we will, people in this space will pull back into these tribes really quickly, right? So there's like the Bitcoin maxis, there's people who are like, you know, there's ETH, there's all these different tribes of kind of people. And, and you know, and every now and then, I think all of us who are on Twitter, you kind of activate one of these tribes and then you know, your DMs fill up and you're like, okay, but when it comes down to it, there's this kind of fundamental narrative around the brand of cryptocurrencies. And so as needed, I think you see a lot of the community come together from various parts of this ecosystem to combat things like initially like crypto, you know, only used for criminals and criminal activity and nefarious, nefarious. I think we've made a lot of progress on that as a community. Now, of course, we're seeing energy, 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 you know, consumption. If you, you know, if you uh, engage in any way with these protocols, you are killing bunnies and boiling the ocean and whatnot. And so I'm, I'm curious to, and I think there's going to be the next round of criticism that comes up. There's going to be something that's got some uh, portion of truth behind it that then gets driven and kind of seen as the dominant narrative by those who are skeptical or critical or threatened or whatever it is by this particular movement. And so I'm curious um, how you all think about memes as being kind of a, a force, like very, thinking about this very literally, like how do you think about memes as being kind of a force that can help drive the narrative that is contesting some of these different uh, criticisms that are coalescing and the current one, of course, being around energy use. Yeah, so the, so to start, uh, I guess you should understand that the, even the criticism, they're memes too, right? It's the, like it's a meme that Bitcoin is uh, destroying the planet and so on. Yep. Um, and just like with um, memes that support our side, you know, there is misinformation there too. So one thing that we can do is just sort of like, like the, there's like the two degree study, like the, the earth is going to get warm by two degrees or whatever. Like, so while there's no denying that Bitcoin uses a lot of energy, we can at least bring the conversation back to earth a little bit by, by just like toning it down and addressing the, the particularly extreme views. Um, beyond that, there's a thesis that's been put forward by the Bitcoin community that Bitcoin can be useful in managing the grid. Uh, all of us have sort of anecdotal evidence about this. We know people doing stuff that uh, relating to like solar and things, but we need to do a better job of proving this. Uh, and, and I think the next couple of years will bear that out. Uh, Cause as of right now, we are not really, we're not doing a good job of doing that. So one of the things that's challenging is that memes hate nuance. The, the simpler they are, the better they are. So two degrees warmer is a super easy thing to latch onto, right? It's not just, it's going to boil the oceans. There's a specific number that people can have. And um, oftentimes incorrect information is more memeable because it's more reductive, right? So I, I think that that's a, that's a real challenge because 
you know, from a battle of ideas standpoint, um, responding to uh, to a, a kind of a wrong, like an outright unfactually incorrect, you know, uh, meme with nuanced discussion is is a is a hard proposition. It's the only choice in a lot of ways, you know, or at least it's the baseline choice. Is you just have to have people who are willing to take the time to engage with the set of people who are open to it or for whom it doesn't resonate. And you know, ultimately, I think it's important to remember that when it comes to something like that particular meme, you don't need to have everyone in the world convinced Bill Maher can do whatever he wants on his show. You have to have kind of key uh, people convinced, right? That's where the that's where the actual battle is. So that's one thing. Yeah. I think the second thing, going back, Sheila, to kind of where you were starting, like the idea of um, external threats as a as a catalytic force for you know cross tribal communities. I think that that perhaps has happened sometimes, but um, I am I'm pre exhausted for when Ethereum switches to POS because every conversation on Twitter literally for uh, months, I don't know, a year is going to be Ethereum's dancing on the grave of Bitcoiners saying, we always knew proof of work was dead. Like they will be the single largest, most antagonistic group when it comes to uh, the evils of proof of work that the world has ever seen, way worse than these groups. And like, I understand the psychological trauma and PTSD that Ethereans have from years of Bitcoiners shitting all over them, you know? So like, I, it's easy to understand how we get in this spiral, but I am super, super not looking forward to that transition, if only for the relitigation of energy arguments that we're going to have. Like, like I said, I'm pre-exhausted already thinking about it. So I, I want to pick up on I can, this. Uh, no, Niraj, please. Yes. Dive in. Yeah, so um, over the years, we kind of see ourselves as representing all of crypto, right, as a family uh, to, to government and whoever else might be interested. And over the years, we've been initially shocked and now we're sort of jaded about it uh, at the <laughs> we've been shocked by the amount of tribalism and sort of friendly fire that happens. So uh, a couple of years ago, kind of the flip side of what Nathaniel is, is dreading is um, we had every sort of Bitcoiner saying that Ether is a security and they were rooting for uh, a regulatory sort of knockout of their competition or what they viewed as competition. So of course, then we got a ton of, uh, we caught some grief for, for advocating for a position that helped Ethereum and coins like it. And we're going to catch the same kind of grief from, from the people that we previously helped for advocating for letting the market choose between proof of work and proof of stake. So, so I think, you know, it, it's possible to put a, uh, you know, it's going to seem a little odd, but a um, silver lining on what seems like this horrible battle, this tribalism, right? And that is to say that it really probably couldn't be any other way. Like it feels, it feels so destructive. It feels like um, that, you know, divide and rule is the way that the colonialists have always controlled, uh, you know, the, the locals. Uh, and that if ultimately, you know, we're breaking up into tribes, then yeah, the, the colonials on Wall Street are going to keep ruling the, ruling the day. However, like the essence of this open source model is competition. That's what it is. Uh, and as we said at the outset, it is a competition for meaning. So whether we like it or not, this is what's going to happen. Um, it seems like there could be more constructive work to be done collectively, but it's just almost impossible to avoid. Um, so uh, just, I want to shift though back to this energy conversation because you made a really good point, uh, NLW, talking about sort of simple ideas versus complex ones. And, and one of the reasons why uh, I think Bitcoin, you know, that the POW model and the idea that it could actually be a constructive uh, force for helping grid management, but also in some respects, providing revenue guarantees that would drive the generation of renewable energy and the like. It, why that struggles to get resonance is because it requires people to put their heads around complexity. Like it, it, the real value proposition for Bitcoin is that it will actually make the system better. That it will, it's not that it will be green per se, or that it will be fossil fuels per se, but that the way that we allocate resources into uh, energy could be, and they emphasize the word could, because it depends on what policies and, and strategies we put in place, but it could be energized and driven by this. But to do that, you have to think about systems. You have to think about the forces, the incentives at work and everything else. And, and that's just really hard, particularly on, in, in, I'd like to hear Niraj's thoughts as well. Like 
legislators, right? How do you get them to get their head out of something that is otherwise a very quick, short statement? We, I feel like in some respects, the epidemic should help because that is a story in complexity that people have had to deal with. But even that's been reduced to simplicity. How do we, how do we, how do we translate complexity mm -hmm. into simplicity is what my question is. You know, I just want to add to that quickly, because I feel like yes and no, right, Michael? Like, I feel like this isn't a war I think you win in the media or on Twitter. And I, to, I can't remember quite who said it, but, you know, this is something, this is a, a case you make often behind closed doors. I mean, look, I mean, look who you're talking to at this point, right? And this is kind of what we what we do a lot of. It's like we, we along with Neeraj and, and Nathaniel and others, right, we, we go behind closed doors and we have these incredibly complicated systems driven, you know, nuanced conversations about pros and cons and possibilities and, and trade-offs and risk and, you know, all these kinds of things. Right. And so I think on some level, there's kind of a hearts and minds argument, which is just kind of politics 101. Like you got to get people to use the thing and trust it enough to use it. And they're not going to do that if they think that they're, you know, stabbing baby deer every time they do anything, you know, that's not going to work. Um, on the other hand, for it to, to thrive, you need to have an enabling environment that's often driven by underlying regulation, or at least the threat of regulation being in a positive direction, not a negative direction. That only comes, I think, through conversations that often happen out of the public eye. So it's kind of balancing those things that I think is important and why you know, I'm heartened that there are people that are focusing attention on maybe more waiting a little bit more towards like the public sphere versus kind of what's happening behind closed doors. But in most cases, most of, most of us are trying at least to do, to do both. But I, I'd love to hear from, from near Nathaniel and your views. Well, one thing that uh, I neglected to mention earlier, but probably should bring up now is that I feel like when you're getting into the energy use conversation, the first point that you have to make is that this energy is not a waste, right? It's doing something useful. And the way that I think you show that is by people using it for things that are useful, that are maybe a little bit more uh, sympathetic than some of the trading that goes on. So like uh, the use in Nigeria and in Belarus, for example. So like, I think we are going to see more of that as, as the years wear on. And hopefully we can build a case to show that this isn't the sort of Silicon Valley play thing that it's been framed as. And what are your thoughts? I mean, you made it's a pretty good episode recently where you you broke down the letters E S G and you made a case for Bitcoin based on that, and that was an exercise, as far as I could tell, in in doing this and trying to break down complexity into a simple meme, essentially. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think uh, so. I want to actually go back to something that Neeraj was saying in terms of the meme, the counter meme, right uh, around the energy debate of um, Bitcoin being a uh, a market catalyst for tapping into energy that would otherwise be lost or stranded. I think that is easily the germ of the most um, high potential counter argument to the energy conversation, right? Because I mean, to your point, Niraj, like the, it, it, we get to decide what society spends its precious energy on argument is while super true is like, you need a college course in like ethics and foundational philosophy to get into that. You know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, Joe Weisenthal summed this up super crisply. He's like, look, you guys can talk all you want. The energy debate comes down to people who like Bitcoin and think it's useful and people who don't. Right. And it's like everything else is, is noise beyond that. However, I do think that there's this germ of an idea capturing stranded energy, energy that would otherwise be flared off. Like this is highly compelling. And there are this set of small anecdotes starting. There's these set of companies coming, but it's not something that you can, there's a lot more uh, pointed to utopian visions of it, right? Like one of the pieces of media around this that caught a lot of people's attention was the um, 2020 Stone Ridge Holdings letter from Ross Stevens, where he talked about this being one of the three or four kind of, you know, big shifts for him thinking about about Bitcoin was the total reorganization of society where uh, you know it could cities could spring up around energy and Bitcoiners were super enthusiastic about this. It's an awesomely written letter. Yeah, it was, it's, it was it definitely yeah, it was sees it? the future. However, imagine that you're someone who's not interested in Bitcoin yet. And you're like, wait a second. So now we have to go re like leave our cities that like have organized around the grid to like create frontier societies around like you know, like waterfalls in the Congo, like that's, that's what you're saying. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's so kind of 
complex. Again, you know, like when you're talking about fundamental reorganizations of society, I think that the first wave and the second and the third, whatever wave of people that were on who got into Bitcoin are excited about the idea of change and large scale systems change. And, and the farther, the deeper in that we get, the more likely it is that people who just want things to be a little bit better for the people around them. And I think that you even see this a little bit in like, take for a moment, you will suspend disbelief and look at both Bitcoin and Dogecoin as protests, as protest coins. Let's say that you are a cusp, you know, between uh, millennials and Gen Z and you're sitting there and you're like, well, I'm still super in debt from college and I don't really know what my life is about. I know that definitely I can't really leave a city yet because I haven't found my person or my people. You know what I mean? Like there's all these things and buying a house isn't really an option. And I don't really know what my life is going to look like. And you know, meanwhile, the financial media is telling me not to eat avocado toast. Like that's pretty much the discourse that's associated with me. What becomes more appealing as uh, as a as an fu as a middle finger to that? One Bitcoin with its like brilliant articulation and you know structural design. The critique, the protest inherent in Bitcoin is built into the design of the thing in terms of limitations on how many there are and how it's self organized. The predictableness of the monetary policy, the unchangeability of it. All of these things are built into the design of the system, right? It's this beautiful architecture. People tell you you have to take hours to, to go down the rabbit hole. Or a dog coin that says, screw you, let's try the dog money. Like, obviously, the second is massively more resonant, like easily because it's absurdist. It's, it's, it's a way to throw it back in the face. It's like, okay, you say I like, you're literally a generation hoarding all of the wealth, but I'm supposed to, you know, not make coffee or make coffee in my apartment to save money. I, I'm just going to love GME and dog coins and stuff. Now, obviously I think that it's hugely reductive and, and probably over valorizing to call that the entire kind of motivation behind Dogecoin. But I think that it gets to the, the simplicity argument that we're having around kind of memes and, and how attractive they are, you know? So I, I don't know, we've kind of gone all over the place from, from the sake, from the starting point of the conversation, but I've been thinking about this a lot because obviously like you can't have Doge at, you know, above 50 cents and not have a conversation about this, which is, you know, what my show has been about this week. And you just got me thinking, so another pro, uh, common and very popular sort of counter meme attempt from the Bitcoin community is the uh, well, how much money does the dollar use for the banking system or whatever? Um, and I'm afraid I've once again more criticism than support to offer. Uh, I just don't think that's convincing to anybody, right? Because uh, if we like, okay, let's say Bitcoin is on the trajectory to replace everything, which, you know, that's for debate, I would say. Uh, even that's like 50, that's like many years in the future. And uh, I don't think anybody who we are trying to uh, who isn't already a believer in Bitcoin believes that it has any type of potential to do that. Um, I don't even know if I personally think it can fully get there. Uh, so like, they're like, it's like, why are you even talking about it? You're not going to replace that. You're just adding on top of that. So it's like the, uh, I think we can just do a better job of, of taking these criticisms seriously and, and uh, addressing kind of their specific points. You know, I've been talking to a bunch of friends recently about kind of people who aren't getting vaccines and why they're on the fence and whatnot, right? And, and we think it just boils down to path of least resistance. Like what's easier to do? Is it easier to get a vaccine when it's around the corner from my house? Great, then I'll do it. If I have to drive three hours, I'm just like not going to do it because I'm kind of like, eh, whatever. And an awful lot of people kind of fall into this path of least resistance bucket. And we kind of prefer as a society to imagine that everyone has a very extreme point of view on things and they're kind of for our view or against our view. But most people are kind of like, eh, if that thing makes sense to me and it's, and it's easy, then I'm going to do it. And if it makes sense to me, but it's hard, I probably won't because I'm lazy and lazy is going to win every time. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to do it. But what making sense means is I think exactly to your point, it's usually a pretty narrow incremental kind of thing. Like most people are not like, oh, the revolution. Yes, that's awesome. Let's do that. They're like, oh, I can do something a little bit faster, a little bit easier. I can do it from my couch or whatever. Therefore, that seems cool. I'll do that then. Okay, why not? You know? And so I think that we in this space, because we are so passionate and we're still a space that's full of people who are passionate believers in this, we haven't yet brought a ton of people over into this. And more and more we're seeing that. But there aren't that many people who are kind of like neutral on it. Like people who are entering this space are still pretty 
pretty, you know, out there in terms of our, our belief that this is really, that we're onto something here, right? Um, that comes across, it, it's apocryphal in some way. And I think we have to spend a lot more time, uh, you know, I think to the points both of you are making, just imagining and really putting ourselves in the mindset of people who are, can be convinced. And the tipping point is really much more about convenience and ease than it is about really any of the other things that we talk about. And even if there is this meme around about, oh, I'm doing a bad thing, you know, I'm helping criminals or I'm doing a bad thing for the environment. I tend to be more cynical than that. And I tend to feel like most people aren't really going to care if it's providing them some tangible benefit that's actually meaningful. And this is why I think we're seeing near to your point, we are seeing adoption in different ways in certain parts of the world than in other parts of the world, because the, the, the leap there, if you want to call it that is, is more meaningful. So, so it might be an interesting opportunity here just to like, uh, do a little bit of a tour of, of the memes of, of crypto that have come through the history. And I think Niraj, you're probably the best place to do it, you know, and, I, and I'm just thinking like, you know, maybe it's a sort of walk down memory lane sort of thing. Right. I mean, I remember when I first uh, got into Bitcoin, um, one of the big ones was, was the honey, honey badger of money. And, and, and I actually think that is one of the greatest memes, right? Because it's, um, it also used a, a, a line that, uh, you know, that, that, that Andreas used uh, describing it as a sewer rat, right? And he, what he meant by that was a term of affection, a, 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 of admiration, because it was tough. It would survive everything. Um, ha, I, suppose, I suppose the question would be like, has that endured? I mean, do you think that, that that has resonated outside of the community? People get it that Bitcoin's this thing that is just being beaten up all the time or it always comes back and survives? So it's funny, actually, now that you mentioned it, I realized that I haven't heard Honey Badger in like years. Uh, but I think like... <laughs> I, I think that description has held up and I think that it has penetrated more into the mainstream now because the 2017, 2018, that's what it was, right? Yeah. Run up uh, was sort of, was it, it was the coming out party for Bitcoin, right? It was like on the front page of every newspaper on everyone's lips. Uh, and then it, of course it went down again, <laughs> it crashed. So that was it. That was supposed to be it. Like we knew that that was like the fifth or fourth, whatever it was crash, but like to the world, that was it. It, it, it had come and gone. Uh, and now it's back again. And suddenly they're like, wait, didn't it do that once before, right? With the Mt. Gox crash. And then, right, and so people are like, okay, this thing is actually, uh, I think this idea that it doesn't go down that easy is really now taken hold. It's probably what I think is making not only uh, asset allocators take it seriously, but also like regulators too are like, okay, this thing is here to stay. Yeah, I would say that the twin pillars of uh, Bitcoin's continuous uh, uh, recruitment of new people from outside are on the top side, the number go up technology. And the fact that if you like, if you just adjust the lines long enough, it beats almost everything and it just keeps doing it. And then on the other side of it, the unkillability, right? These are kind of like the twin poles of the things. It's like, you know, I don't know if they're updated now, but there's so many sites that keep track of how many times it was declared dead. And that's sort of now, like what, what would the equivalent of being declared dead now being like, oh, it's going back to 30,000, you know, like 150% of the number that it was like, that was like in our minds as the achievable or as the, the hopeful goal for like three years. You know what I mean? So like, I feel like those two things work in concert. One is a, um, one is a, is a why you can't ignore the thing. And then the other is kind of a, a why you want to be in on the thing. There's a lot in between there, obviously, but ultimately it's a financial asset and, um, yep. it's, it's persistence and it's growth or, or what attract people in, even if they go other places from there. So, so the persistence is interesting. I, I've tried to convince people that, um, the actual use case, the real value of Bitcoin is that it can't be shut down. It, 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 that in itself, right? regardless of its function as money or anything else, it is a record keeping system that can't be shut down. That, that is very, very powerful. And, and that to me is like the, the first thing you get here. And then you think about money after that, right? So we, it, it's, it, is a, it, it is that persistence of the record that I think is by far the most important thing. You need that to build money on, but we, we get lost in all these other conversations around it. So I want to throw another meme at you, NLW, because you've spent much of the past year looking at these big macro questions about where, you know, is money going from the central bank's perspective, right? And, and I, I suppose the person, one of the person, people who have really given Niraj a run for his money over the years is, is Meltem, Meltem uh, Demiris, who uh, has been, I think, the author of a number of, uh, I was going to talk about her 
Bitcoin as a battery thing. But let's just focus on one that I'm pretty sure Melton was at least, if not the author of, certainly was the propagator. And that is that uh, money printer go brr, right? This thing just became this shorthand for uh, the idea that the, the central banks were printing massive amounts of money. Um, it's, it's not actually the case, right? It, it's, there's, they're, they're not literally printing money. This is, a, this is an act of, of you know, basically adding to bank reserves. And there's all this complex systems behind it. Um, I don't know that it matters that much, but I'm wondering whether you, know, you could talk about the importance of that meme and, and, and this idea that's implanting. And you're even seeing people like Larry Summers talk about the risk of inflation, not that he's using that meme, of course. But you know, how significant has the Bitcoin community's conversation with the use of these memes and others been in, in raising concerns about you know, excessive money printing you know, in this way? Larry Summers concerns about him not having a seat of the national conversation more like, but um, I, I, I think the uh, part of what made last year such an important year is the um, transcendence of that meme from our little world to the wider scale, right? Uh, it was, I mean, Last year, basically, FinTwit started looking like Bitcoin Twitter as it related to this particular meme. This was the common thread, and it was the connective tissue around a bunch of different responses. Obviously, there was fierce competition about whether the right response to Money Printer Go Burr was Bitcoin, which is the camp that we were all in and the camp that ultimately people like Paul Tudor Jones and then Sam Druckenmiller and then you name it, Bill Miller, uh, all, all kind of you know helped presage this, um, this institutional uh, fun flow into Bitcoin. For others, it was another kind of way to, to pitch gold and gold was looking good there for a little bit before it really kind of stopped looking good. And it really seemed that Bitcoin started to suck a huge amount of oxygen out of that space. Um, but it was also the motivating force behind the kind of YOLO GameStop Davy Day trader phenomenon, right? The Robin Hood trader phenomenon as well. All of these people were recognizing, uh, I think, the, a common impulse that, you know, Michael, going back to you're asking whether it matters, I don't think it really matters what the actual mechanics of money creation are. Again, people on Fintwit and people who are kind of heavily invested in actual MMT and things like that will tell you that it does. And, and they're right to some extent because what the actual implications are will be a function of what actually happens. But for people who are using that meme, what they're really talking about is, I think, pointing to something that Travis Kling has repeatedly called the greatest monetary policy experiment in history. You know, we're, we're 12 years in now, and it is what's for sure is that we are in uncharted waters. And um, what the battle is in many ways is for what the likely breadth of outcomes are and how you want to hedge yourself against them. And I think part of why Bitcoin has been able to jump into the mainstream institutional world is that you didn't have to go all the way to Niraj's point to uh, this is going to replace the dollar to, hey, if we're talking about probabilistic outcomes of a massive new monetary policy experiment, having a hedge against one of those possible outcomes, which is, you know, X, Y, Z, right, uh, is, is probably a good idea. And I think that the, um, you know, the, 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 the question or, you know, that, that, I mean, to me, that was the obvious and most important meme of last year and probably kind of a foundational meme for a lot of what we're going to be discussing for, for some time. So yeah. this, sorry, Neeraj, please. Neeraj, yeah. Yeah, I was going to add to that, I guess. Uh, so for better or for worse, people are talking about inflation now more than uh, ever, I guess, or more than in my memory. Uh, shows how short my memory is, I guess. But um, like the Bank of America put out that study that said earning re earnings reports are starting to talk more and more about it. Um, and I think that the reason that that took hold in particular last year was, of course, there's people, there's a lot more money being created but also amid the COVID sort of uh, further degradation of faith in our institutions, it just, I think that added to it and kind of made it a perfect storm. This wider narrative of, of the powers that be losing control of the situation and trying to print out of it. So following this journey of memes, it bounced all over the place here, but I mean, I, I, I watched, um, uh, you know, Michael Saylor's debate with, um, I'm going to have to come back and edit this in, Michelle. I'm having a really bad time remembering names at the moment. Uh, the the gold, 
but old, old guy about gold. Yeah. It was actually a really good debate. I mean, Sailor, I think won it, but um, in any case, let's just, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll recut this, uh, Michelle. Um, and Sailor was criticized for um, uh, the, the fact that he was kind of infantilizing, if you like, Bitcoin. He thought it was beneath the, uh, the, the so it, it didn't add any seriousness to it. And, and he specifically talked about the laser eyes, right? That we've just seen right across every, every uh, you know, person on crypto Twitter, not myself, but others, uh, their avatars on Twitter. Uh, first of all, Niraj, I mean, where did that come from? <laughs> do you have any idea what it actually means and what it service, services? And, and what do we do with that kind of criticism that these sort of things are silly and they, and they make it just pointless and, and you can't sort of have a seat at the table of serious debate if you're constantly going to be coming up with all these crazy, you know, sci-fi memes and the like. Yeah, I actually, I had the laser eyes on. Um, I didn't know this at the time, but it was the, the idea was laser eyes until Bitcoin gets to hundred K it was like, the thing I thought it was just like power levels, like an anime show. And I think I got quoted in Coinbase saying that and I was wrong. So sorry about that. I'm sorry, Coindesk. Sorry. I do that with Coin Center too. Um, uh, so uh, the, the point about infantilizing is definitely there. It's, I don't think that's the right word though. It's sort of, I think the Bitcoin community is kind of uh, struggling with this is they, a lot of their, memes, their community memes are very insular and sort of inward facing. Uh, they seem to be more about uh, reinforcing the decisions that somebody else has made to, to join the community mm -hmm. rather than trying to bring new people into the community or convince uh, outsiders that what the community is doing is important. So laser eyes became sort of a uh, uh, I'm in the club signal. Uh, same with the, uh, of course, uh, have fun staying poor, which I'm very much on the record of at this point of saying I don't like uh, because it's uh, it. If you ask a Bitcoiner uh, what it means, they say, "Oh, it means that you know you are uh, too risk averse to make a decision that will help your life." It's like, no, it looks like you're just making fun of somebody for not having enough money, right? Like that's that's what it looks like to somebody who doesn't know that lore. Um, so I think this is something that I hope to see. Uh, I don't think the Bitcoin community will ever stop doing this, but I just hope that the uh, the voices that don't necessarily do that type of stuff will, will get more elevated in the future. But NLW, like how, right? This is not a community that there is nobody in charge as much as, you know, Near Edge might be the, the, the chief meme officer. Um, you know, how, how, do, how on earth do we control? We can't set a bunch of mandates. We can't tell people don't say this, do say that. How does the community itself go through an exercise of trying to come up with anything that is considered constructive um, in this way? Well, I mean, I'm not totally sure it needs to is my answer. So I got the laser eyes and I think we're overthinking it. I think it's fun. And I also think, let's put it this way. What percentage of Bitcoin hasn't moved for two years or more? Huge percentage, right? How, what is the percentage of buys on a Coinbase or a river platform when the price starts to dip? Huge percentage. Insular memes have the function of reinforcing the fact that you're not insane to keep fighting, right? People talk about the idea that, uh, you know, holders are just lucky if they got there early. And I think it's totally inaccurate, right? Like, I know for like, I had a chance to get into Bitcoin early in like 2012 in San Francisco. And I didn't. And it wasn't until much later when I was thinking about it from a completely different framework. And the only reason that I don't punch myself every day, thinking about like how much money I left on the table is that I know that at some point, like there would have been, you know, rent to pay and I would have done it. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, there's no way that I would have had, I don't think the, like the conviction, the stamina to hold that long. So I think that there is an important function of insular memes as well. I think that that community organizing function matters. And I don't think any guys were, were saying that that's not the case. I just think it's important to, to call that out too. I also think this is kind of my, my flip side argument is that the, one of the things that reassures me about crypto Twitter and Bitcoin Twitter is 
the disparity between how important we think it is and the actual cosmic insignificance of it in terms of like <laughs> the rest of the world, you know, like <laughs> it is it's even wading into it. Like it is, I mean, it's like that meme of the guy who walks into the, the kid who walks into the room and then the baby turns right around. I think a lot of people have that experience with it where they're like, cool, not for me, but <laughs> it is these battles that we have are, are largely for our own amusement. Now, where I think that they can get genuinely damaging is to the extent that they create uh, norms that really are uh, disinviting of people and when people want to come in. And there are, there, I think there are communities that are uh, unattracted to Bitcoin because they do wade into that and it's a fight. So I don't want to be dismissive uh, entirely of, of some of those risks, but I do think that like we probably have an overestimation of how important our conversations are on Twitter to the long-term ascendance or not of, of Bitcoin and the rest of the crypto industry as well. So I, mean, I think, oh, go ahead, Nurish. So uh, I agree with what you just said. And I have to, I guess, caveat what I said that my mindset is always sort of like crypto, how crypto is perceived in the mainstream world. And for me, the mainstream world is like Twitter journalists. I know Twitter is not real life, but that's just, it's my life. And, uh, and so that is why I, cringe when I see some of the stuff I see. Well, yeah, you, I mean, you have put yourself in a position to try to explain and, you know, like kind of translate a lot of that. So I think it makes sense that you have a, a, a higher kind of radar for which things can be potentially damaging because, you know, you're also dealing with an enfranchised set of people who are potentially looking at those conversations as relevant for, you know, where that place is. So I, I my kind of broad point certainly doesn't, uh, doesn't mitigate the, the place mm -hmm. that you are either. Well, and I think it's changed over time too, to some extent. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who are in positions to make decisions that really are going to affect the adoption curve around this stuff and whether, you know, where and where, where and whether and how it can be, it can be utilized um, that are now actually in some of these spaces that before they weren't present in. So you've got like SEC commissioners who are on Twitter. You've got, you know, you've got ministers I know who are on Twitter and, and who may or may not as an entry point understand, you know, what the community is trying to, to relay, which is, I think is, is it's a, there's a difference. There's a difference now as this gets more and more attention. Some of that does come through on social as well. My DMs are a pretty weird set of people. I got to say <laughs> of like, yep. yeah, like Sounds right. random <laughs> things. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a little strange. I just reopened mine and I think I have to close them already. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> can I, hey, can I say something nice about crypto Twitter? Because I was kind of just bagging on it too. Please I've been thinking about it a lot in the context of just general FinTwit. Um, because FinTwit's kind of like the big brother, you know, like older sibling or whatever. And it's so not. Like, I think this bull market has exposed just how big a difference there is between crypto Twitter and FinTwit. And, um, uh, so I think FinTwit is actually massively, massively more vacuous, irrelevant, and annoying than than crypto Twitter. The reason for that is that the fights are much more vicious on crypto Twitter, on Bitcoin Twitter, or whatever. But the at least it's with people who are actively shaping and making these things that they're fighting about, right? It's like when you have protocol creators or DeFi engineers or developers or, you know, whatever, they're, they're actual builders who are arguing for their perception of the world where FinTwit is just this constant, like, it's basically like, what's the thesis statement of your paid newsletter that you're trying to sell to people? And that's your position going into every conversation. And it's unbelievably easy to see. No one changes their minds because what they're selling is the product of themselves. And there's a little bit of that, obviously, on, on, on crypto Twitter in terms of kind of like the identity. But the, the, the substance of what people are debating is so much more interesting. So, you know, I, I think that it is a very kind of weird gladiatorial arena a little bit, but I, I've, I've been appreciating the fights more. I have kind of like a, um, uh, a, a rule that I won't engage in fights, but I appreciate where they are compared to a lot of the other stuff on, on Twitter. Yeah, our, our fights have a lot more substance. They're like uh, in, in FinTwit, someone who loves Tesla and someone who hates Tesla just duking it out. Like, what are they? The, in, the result of their conversation is meaningless. But if you get uh, two kind of influential DeFi developers hacking it up, they could actually make changes to, to the world. And that is interesting. Plus it gives people who are interested in joining their projects or whatever, an insight into how they think. And like there actually is a chance of them affecting the world. 
so so where you guys are going with with this is something that like would be fun to just like keep going with but unfortunately we're going to run out of time and and that is that like in some respects you know that thesis that you've, you've both just embraced is is saying that you know crypto crypto twitter is actually making just is Twitter itself what it's supposed to be, right? I mean, we 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 think about social the, the great dream of social media, the great dream of the internet for that matter, was that it would be a bazaar of ideas, that this marketplace of ideas, and we'd all come out and fight over the best one and the best one would rise. But it, but the idea was that it would be of debates of substance, not of, of vacuous nothingness. And <laughs> and in some respects, you know, that dream has been undermined by the fact that centralized institutions control the internet, especially social media. Um, and, and we've had all of our opinions corralled into these echo chambers and everything else. So the idea that crypto Twitter has found this space where they can still keep fighting is, is actually a very positive thing in that sense, right? It's it, that, that they're, they're defying the, I suppose, uh, normalization um, and the sanitization of the debate. Um, and, and bringing us back to substance, which I think is a really healthy way to think about this, because people who know what I'm interested in is not just money, it's actually this, the future of media, the future of conversation, the future of, of how we create meaning in the world. So the fact that we were able to like have this meandering but fun conversation around two things that I care deeply about has great brought great joy to me. Uh, th <laughs> thank you both for being here. Thank you, Sheila, of course, for, for once again joining us. Thank you, Niraj. Thank you, NLW. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, make sure you tune again next week again for another episode of Money Reimagined. Bye for now.